Could the usher please open the back door? We need ventilation and Subdeacon Richard, could you check around and see if people have enough air? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, we, uh, Father Nabil and I, read each other's bulletins, and I was saddened to see this morning the news of the passing of Marie Jabour. May God rest her soul. I remember Marie and her husband, Robert, many years ago passed away. One of the very dedicated families of our cathedral. You know, we're one church, one church, one diocese, one archdiocese. And I was blessed to be here during the time of Father Paul Romley. God rest his soul, Huria, Huria Pat, those years of his pastorate and how much he taught me. Remember when we arrived in August of 1990, it was their home that we were in for two weeks before we had a place to stay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Christ is in our midst. Yes. Today's lesson of the prodigal son is the second of two lessons that introduce us to the season of Great Lent. It is what the church prescribes in what is called the Triodion, the book that helps us to pray and reflect upon the teachings of Jesus, because we pray the Bible in the Orthodox Church. And so the fathers of the church have written these beautiful prayers, too many to number, you can't count them with your hands. We heard in last week's lesson of the Pharisee and the publican, the simplest, and what is possibly the most potent of the gospel lessons of how a person, as did the Pharisee, could do everything, did everything's right, just as, as a Christian, we can do a lot of things right, but can be still shut out of the kingdom. It was a very direct and sobering teaching of how humility is the essential ingredient to true repentance in our way of salvation. It helped us to recognize what it is that we need a right attitude in approaching God and conversing with him. The prayer is not about me, my, or I, just like how it says about the Pharisee, he prayed about himself. <laughs> It's understanding how the Christian way of life is, is full of paradoxes. You want to be first, you have to be last. You want to truly live, you must die. You want to lead, you must become a servant. You want to be a follower of Christ, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and so on and so on. And so today, the parable of the prodigal son is a very profound teaching on the love of God, as exhibited in the story of an earthly father, but a man who did what most fathers would probably consider impossible to do, especially in first century Palestine as a Semitic daddy. And Jesus was teaching a lesson that sounded quite absurd and one that could have very easily have made his listeners laugh. And we might regard the parable as a beautiful story. Examining it closely conveys a very difficult teaching. Just imagine a father who would first grant the younger of two sons to receive all of his inheritance before his father dies. And then to have the freedom to squander his inheritance in what the Bible says was riotous living. And you heard the gospel. And imagine that father who anxiously 
awaiting for his son to return, seeing him from a distance, runs. He doesn't wait. <laughs> he doesn't walk. He runs to meet him, kissing him. And then what is the most profound instance of the parable that takes place following the return of the youngest son, his father pleading and begging his eldest son to join him in celebrating the return of his younger brother. Unheard of. <laughs> Perhaps even for today. You know, today, <clears throat> Our social and cultural way of life, what I prefer to say in America as our way of life, because if we want to talk about what is American culture, it's not the way we're living today. Our way of life has made the lesson much more complex. <clears throat> Many young people struggle in our day with having a clear definition of what is home. And what is returning home? What it really means? Also, which home? What home? Whose home? So rather than spending a lot of time sorting out all of the complexities, or even trying to understand the psychology of a young person's struggle, you can read about our youth survey and its results on the Archdiocese website. And I really suggest you read it. One of the jewels of today's lesson is not unlike last week's lesson of the Pharisee and the publican heard in the words of St. John Climacus. He's commemorated on the second Sunday of Lent. He said this, Let your prayer be simple, for both the publican, unlike the Pharisee, and the prodigal son, unlike his older brother, were both reconciled to God by a single phrase. And what were the words of these grown men's prayers? Father, I have sinned, said the prodigal. And the word of the publican, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Which is like what the church teaches every young person to pray the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. It is what the church says is the capsule, the heart of the gospel. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Now, a close examination of the Greek text uses the phrase to armartolo, meaning using the definite article, the sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Which even implies that the publican may have had a relationship to the Pharisee. If Father Paul Romley was with us today, I could just hear him say, as he often would, wow, wow. Think about it. Think about it. You see, folks, all of Jesus' conversations were with real people and real relationships was what he was about. Not concepts, not ideas. Not speculation in our imagination. Real persons, of which he was and who is ho on. He who is eternal. And what are the words of the apostle? St. Paul, the words we memorize, the words that we pray before receiving the sacrament of Holy Communion, I believe, O Lord, and I confess that thou art truly the Christ, the Son of the living God, who didst come into the world to save sinners of whom I am the first. That's not, it's in the Bible. 
That's the words of St. Paul. That's the prayer that we pray. It's actually called the priest's prayer, but now we pray it all together as a church. You see, folks, the parable of the prodigal son in today's gospel is a lesson that helps us to envision what we who believe in a loving and merciful God are called to do. <clears throat> for whom and for what? Build a church? Yes. Be part of a fellowship? Yes. But most importantly, discovering that being at home is being in our Father's house, where we prodigals return home again and again and again. You and I are here today in church because someone was a model and example who with whatever faults they may have had were men and women who made sacrifices, who took the time to listen and had the time to care, just like Lila. Just like Lila. And so whether they are alive or have passed on from this life, that person or persons prayed for us and could very possibly be praying for us even now as intercessors, like all of the saints, because we believe in the resurrection. You and I are part of Christ's body and have been called to be part of the church, which is called the body of Christ, for a reason. We have a mission and a purpose, not by design of Father Timothy, or even Father Paul, or Metropolitan Joseph, or a parish council. Our mission, vision, and purpose is doing our Father's business. Acting and behaving, serving and sharing as the inheritors, as wide, wise and faithful stewards of our Father's kingdom, who, whose resources are in fact beyond what we even perceive, understand them to be. And he is always with us. And all that he has is ours. And all that we have is his. The only thing is ours, is our sins. That's what we can only claim to possess. That's Saint Irenaeus. So it's time for you and I to take a close look at ourselves, especially as we approach the season of the great fast. Are we the prodigal spoken of in today's gospel, anxious to get what we consider we rightly deserve for ourselves so we can do what we want in our freedom? Or are we like the older son in the parable who resented the fact that his younger brother did what he jolly well pleased with his father's wealth? As you and I go about doing our regular chores without being properly compensated or even acknowledged. And lastly, notice this. As difficult as it may be to comprehend, <laughs> especially in our day, it was not about the money. I repeat, it was not about the money. Did you hear the words of the father who clearly and lovingly says to his eldest son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. Your brother was dead, but he's alive. He was lost and is found. Our church always gives us the complete picture, <laughs> the full picture, like our iconography. That's one of the reasons why the images we have in our church looks absurd and somewhat distorted to the, nat to the natural eye. Its purpose is not to stimulate our emotions. Its purpose is to convey truth in form and color, and for us to understand, not only in our reasoning of the mind, but in our hearts, and to be motivated. It conveys truth in form and color. And our hymnography, the vocalizing of the text of our prayers, 
helps our minds to contemplate and meditate upon God's truth and to be saturated with it, to bathe in it, to be immersed in it. I pray that the coming season of Great Lent will be for you as a parent, a son or a daughter, a grand grandchild, a godson or daughter, and yes, even as a husband or wife, and also as a godfather or godmother, spiritually rewarding. A time of renewal, a Lenten spring, as my teacher, Father Alexander Schmemann, would call it. That awakening to us, to what is most important, what is essential in knowing and experiencing God's love. The Father, in the person of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the grace and power of his life-giving Spirit.